My name is Deborah Klotchko. I'm the director of the Museum of Photographic Arts, so welcome this evening. Um, thank you for joining us. And it's my pleasure to introduce um, Andy Grunberg, who is currently a professor at the Corcoran School of the Arts and Design at the George Washington University in Washington, DC. And you'll be joining us tonight for a conversation that he and I will have. Um, but he does have some slides that he'll be showing as well that are part of um, the dialogue that we'll be having. Most of you know Professor Grunberg as an art critic, curator, and educator with over 25 years of experience specializing in writing about photography and video within contemporary art. His essays and articles for the New York Times and other publications are collected in Aperture's Crisis of the Real. Other books that he's done include Mike and Doug Starn and Alexei Brodovich. Exhibitions that he's organized include Photography and Art Intersections Since 1946, Ansel Adams, A Legacy, and In Response to Place, Photographs from the Nature Conservancy's Last Great Places. He's also the recipient of an Infinity Award from the International Center of Photography and a Leica Medal of Excellence for writing. So um, what I'd like to do is welcome Andy Grunberg. Okay. Hi. It's great to be here. I have... Uh, been to MOPA many times. I think most recently it was for the uh, Streetwise show of um, um, American street photography from the 1960s, which was a great show. But there have been many exciting things since then that I seem to have missed, and I apologize for that. Um, thanks, Deborah. Thanks for all of you to, for coming out tonight, and especially all the students who uh, had to put aside their other plans to have exciting fun tonight. That, um, because their teachers forced them to come out here. Anyway, um, so I, this is a conversation between Deb and myself, but I, I'm so insecure as, as a speaker that I always want to hide behind somebody else's work. So I'm going to show a few um, pictures to just um, reinforce some points that I want to make from the start. And I've spent the last two days here talking about um, the future of museums, how audiences are changing, how technology cha is changing, and about how that's going to impact how the Museum of Photographic Arts operates and the, and the kinds of programming that it has. And, we're, and it's refreshing to know that it's a very forward-looking institution in thinking about how to deal with um, visual literacy in the 21st century, which arguably is different than what visual literacy was in the 20th century. Um, but tonight, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how photography is changing, too, because I think we have to put those two things together. Um, so, start with the Wayback Machine. So, people of my generation um, re will probably remember a fundamental paradigm shift in what photography was as an art that um, we might locate in the 1970s. Um, and it had to do with artists who basically abandoned the ideas of modernist straight photography and the sort of straight black and white depiction that was, was insisted on um, by people like um, Strand and, and Ansel Adams. And, and started to think about the, mu the medium having all these other possibilities. And, and of course, one of the things they were interested in is how photography related to a larger art world. But they, their approach was to basically think about the photograph, not so the, the structure of the photograph, not as a given, but as something that they could play with. So um, there was a lot of work done with what was a novelty in terms of new technology in the 70s, which was um, copier machines. So um, there first was a thing called a Verifax, and then there was a Xerox machine, and then there was a 3M color and color machine. All these machines got used by artists in different ways. Fax machines or telecopiers were another way in which artists started thinking about 
technology changing. And, and um, for those of you students, um, the, the internet had not been invented yet. I just have to, I just have to put that in. Um, so anyway, so this is, this is sort of an avatar of all that experimentation. It was, it's a um, picture by Robert Heineken from 1968, cleverly titled, Are You Rhea? Um, which uses a really basic early photographic idea, which is the photogram to reproduce a magazine page so that you see both sides of the page at the same time. And he did a whole series of these um, pictures. If I can have the next one, I guess I, I don't get to do the next one. There you go. Um, this is a slightly later one from 88 done in color on, on a material called Cibachrome. Um So one of the things that artists started getting interested in in, in the 70s, and it's most famously um, associated with postmodernist photography and people like Cindy Sherman, is, is to think about how our experience of the world is mediated, and it's mediated by what we then called media, which at the time consisted pretty much of newspapers, magazines, so print materials, um, television, I guess radio maybe, and uh, significantly film and, or cinema. So all that kind of picture material that had been accumulating during the 20th century became a subject for photographers. So they were no longer simply um, assuming that there was fresh material out in the world that no one had ever looked at before, um, but they were actively engaged in questioning and interrogating the kinds of images that were being reproduced through the media of the time. Next picture, please. Um, so, so what happens then in the 20th century, at least so far, is there's another paradigm shift, and it's because there's a whole new set of media that are now impinging on our experience of the world or mediating our experience of the world, um, what we call new media or digital media. Um, it's in a way, a continuation of what happened in the 70s, but it has a lot of other, um, what, consequences. So in a, in a very simple way, the introduction of digital photography um, and a program introduced in 1991 called Adobe Photoshop um, allowed people to make pictures that um, were altered in subtle ways that um, we wouldn't call Reality. This is a Loretta Lux picture um, from 2004, and she's gone to great lengths to adjust the size of the, um, in this case, Lady Gaga's, um, or not get Lady Gaga, sorry, this child, um, to have a bigger head. If we have the next slide, we get Lady Gaga. So this is like sublime and also ridiculous. The, there are um, all kinds of uses of um, Adobe Photoshop. This is by Inez Van Zlamswerda, um, I think 2008. Um, so anyway, so, there, so there's been a lot of artists who looked at this new digital media environment and, and sort of focused on the Photoshop um, possibilities of it. But I think this is like a really tiny um, and perhaps less significant than other um, parts of the of the iceberg that is the new media environment. Um, so if we could have the next slide, please. So this is more what I'm interested in and what I think is a more um, impactful part of what the digital environment means to us today. This is a, a picture from um, 2004 of a um, pair of billboards in Tehran, Tehran, Iran, of um, paintings done of the pictures taken by GIs at Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq. And this was sh soon after they first appeared in the American media. The, they appeared in the American media after they had been um, transmitted from Iraq or wherever um, through the internet and appeared on somebody's um, page or some, some part of the internet that revealed the, these um, abuses. So they were actually, 
first taken as a kind of snapshot, digital snapshot, um, became a huge political scandal here in the United States, and then quickly, because of the virtue of the internet, made their way um, to Iran and became part of a whole, you know, ongoing anti-American propaganda campaign there. Next. So that's sort of the real life example, but art, so artists today are thinking about how photography is not only made, but also how it's transmitted and how it's received and how it's used by the powers that be. And I want to talk about four artists who I find interesting in this regard. This is um, a work by an artist named Jill Majid, or Magid, um, from 2003 in which she designed and then advertised a um, rhinestone-studded surveillance camera, which she actually um, at one point sold to the Amsterdam City Council, but then apparently they kind of caught on to the fact that it was an artist project and um, didn't go that far. Next, please. So what she ended up doing is actually just installing them herself, so she would go and um, find surveillance cameras in the city and, and um, glamorize them. And then when they were discovered and taken down, she would post uh, these posters around the city about the, the glam cams that had been um, vandalized by the city. Next, please. The project that I really love that she did is called the Evidence Locker, and it was done in Liverpool, England, which at the time was the most surveilled city in England. As you know, England has kind of been out front of the new technology of camera surveillance. We saw that at, um, in the London bombing, but um, Liverpool apparently was the first city to do this, and she um, sort of did an artistic investigation and exhumation of how this all worked um, by making friends with the people in the police station who did the monitoring and asked them to try and find her as she, or told, her, told them where she would be um, so that they trained their cameras on her as she walked around the town in a, in a red trench coat. Next. Um, so this is what it looks like in a gallery. It's a video projection. And the way she got the videos is that they have, they, their modus operandi is they have seven days in which they keep, um, 31 days in which they keep the videos and then they're permanently erased, but you can make a request to have the, the um, videos that record you turned over to yourself and taken out of the evidence locker. So she, she filed the public request to have all the pictures that she'd had of herself being tailed um, so that she could create this art, artist video for a um, exhibition. Next, please. Trevor Peglin, who I think some of you already know um, has been shown here is a is an artist who's doing really interesting work in both in terms of surveillance and in terms of reconnaissance. Um, this is a picture of a um, supposedly secret site in which um, the American military is doing something, but it's declared off limits. So he got a very high powered telescope and took pictures through that, and the result is kind of blurry. But you can see things like different or he can, if you can't, um, see different drones on the runway and stuff. Um, next, please. This is from a series that he did slightly later of um, reconnaissance satellites in the sky. So these are, these are um, satellites whose entire job, their, their entire raison d'etre, as we say in France, is to, um, to take pictures of things that are happening in Earth, and, and some of us know what the consequences of that are. Next. This is one of my favorites, um, not just because it's in black and white, because it's kind of an Ansel Adams picture with a, a um, star tracks, and then the one that's not going in the same direction as the rest of the stars is the surveillance satellite. Um, next, please. He did a series on um, patches, which these are, um, he assembled this kind of catalog of all these patches that military actually wear that are for secret operations, so they don't actually ever tell you what it is that they're for, they're, so they're kind of fascinating. There's, there's dozens of them. These are in a book called Patches. Next. Uh, 
and then the most recent work, um, starting in 2010, are pictures in which drones actually appear. And um, you can be the first on your block to tell me where the drone is in this picture. Usually people can see it, but maybe not tonight. Next. Here's an easier one. I think, I think we're striking out. No, I can't even see it on the screen. Um, it's in there. Next, please. So drones, of course, are used as um, devices both to uh, tar target and deliver uh, weaponry in our war against terror, which is now um, 13 years old. And, and so it's interesting to artists um, to think about this because it's all camera technology. This is, this is a way, the, the way they're piloted, the way they're um, directed to certain targets, the way decisions are made whether to fire on a target is all done optically through um, remote control. So there are people in Florida and I think Arizona who make decisions about whether you're um, someplace in Somalia or um, Iraq or wherever is going to is going to have a missile fired at it. Um, this is an artist named James Bridal who had a show. This is the outside of the Corcoran Gallery of Art where I work. Um, James Bridal made a silhouette of a drone, life size, one to one scale, on the sidewalk. And this is exciting because if you walk across the sidewalk, then you're on the White House grounds. Um, I'm not sure Obama ever got to see this, but we imagined that it was that way. Next. But the project that he did, which is I find really fascinating, is um, called Dronestagrams. And using a, a particular um, media, social, I guess it's social media or a social media site um, that, that gives coordinates for drone sites. There's, there's somebody, I think they're in England, that, that records the GPS coordinates, coordinates of drone strikes. And then he, James Bridal went to Google Maps and put those locators in and came out with pictures of these places, um, which he then created a kind of Instagram site where you could actually see where all these drone strikes had happened. Um, some of this is kind of less than precise because presumably the Pentagon may not want us to know exactly where drone strikes have happened. Next, so this, this is just one of the pictures that was on the screen. So um, what's interesting about these artists that are dealing with, with digital media as a transmission device is that they both have the site, which Dronestagram is a site that presumably is an app or something, and, but then he also makes prints so that he can have museum exhibitions of the of same. Next. This is, a, this is Taryn Simon, another artist, an American artist in New York, um, from a series that she did, if I can get it, oh, called An American Index of the Hidden and Unfamiliar. So. One of the things these artists are thinking about is how the visual territory has expanded. So this whole sort of range of surveillance and reconnaissance and thinking about pictures being taken for, um, you know, to basically kill people, all those the kind of like less than happy consequences of the digital rev revolution um, raise the question of, what, so what can't be photographed? What hasn't been photographed? And I think that's what really fascinates Terrence Simon is there's still things that haven't been seen, um, despite the kind of postmodernist idea that everything's already been photographed. She's really interested in things that haven't. And this is, the, these are, um, well, I can read the title, Nuclear Waste Encapsulation and Storage Tanks in um, Han the Hanford site in southwestern Washington state. So these are basically barrels of radiation um, rods that have come from a nuclear power plant now in storage. And for some reason, they store them in the shape of a map of the United States, if you ask me. But um, next, and there's another picture from the same series of a cryopreservation cry, cry unit 
at the cryo cryo preservation laboratory of um, a particular guy. I guess his name is Re Ettinger, is the person that got this idea that um, when you die you should be frozen, and then some sometime later they will figure out how to make you alive again. So. This is actually the, the um, capsule that's waiting for him to die. Um, and all Taryn Simon's work has elaborate captions that tell you more information about this, and it tells you that you can do this yourself for um, $28,000. You can arrange to have yourself preserved this way um, if you do it in advance, but if you do it at the last minute, the discount doesn't apply. It's $34,000. <laughs> Next, please. And this is a series that was exhibited at the and it's called um, A Living Man Declared Dead and Other Chapters. You may have seen this, um, if not in the flesh. There's a great TED Talk on the web, and it's, um, maybe if we go to the next picture, it consists of these large panels, and um, the part that she actually photographed are these series of portraits, and um, they all have to do with bloodlines and families that have feuds, or there's a family of a Palestinian bomber, there's a family of a Zionist who um, is descended from the first settlers in, in um, Palestine. There's, there's all sorts of um, different stories in these chapters, and um, they all have to do with relationships, they all have to do with a kind of catalog of, of families, and, and What's interesting as, as an artistic device is that there are blanks in this thing, and those are people that either um, she couldn't get to, to to photograph, or people who didn't want to be photographed, um, and so, but they're part of the the bloodline. So she just left this kind of blank um, piece of paper as part of that. So anyway, I think I'll I'll stop there just as a kind of um, you know cocktail for what Deb and I are going to be. Talking about, I think that that there is a been since the digital revolution. There's been this vast expansion of photographic territory, both in terms of what artists can take a take advantage of, but also in terms of how um, photography has inured itself to our everyday life. Um, we all are carrying cameras now. We don't have to say to anybody, "Oh, are you a photographer?" when somebody takes a selfie of themselves. Um, so I think that, that that makes questions about how we understand images, how we interpret images, all the more relevant for today. Thanks. So we're now we're going to do our best yeah. Sonny and Cher imitation. <laughs> no, no singing, believe me. Um, so part of the, the main reason that Aunt Professor Grunberg is here is um, to come out and have a, a, a conversation with the museum staff about uh, some changes that we're putting into place and some new opportunities that we have. Uh, to the students that met with us a little bit before this uh, lecture started, the presentation started, we were talking about the idea of, well, the fact that uh, we've got some physical renovation that's happening within the museum. When you came in the front door, there were two very nice white walls on either side of you, but actually those are temporary construction walls, and behind those, we're building out a, a new gallery space, which will have, um, uh, aspects of interactive technology, we're building a new store, and those, while those are physical spaces, uh, they also represent um, a, a new approach that we're looking at, which is our new Becky Moore Center for Visual Learning, which is part of the Museum of Photographic Arts. So in a way, you're getting a sneak preview tonight of um, both the spaces and the concept that's going to be launched at the end of this year. So one of the things, so I'm trying to bring this back around, but uh, one of the things, Andy, that you mentioned to the students that were there is that this was a golden age to be a student of photography. And you talked about the fact that, uh, you know, everything was available to them from um, large format process to um, 
you know, if you want to sort of add to that, uh, I'll let you expand that. But I'm wondering if it's a, a golden age for the Museum of Photography, a Museum of Photography. How's that for a mm. question? Well, it's a golden age for photography students, but there are no jobs out there. So I forgot to mention that part of it. <laughs> um, you can have my job soon. The, um, so it's, it's an interesting situation to be a, a museum that's dedicated to a particular uh, medium, like the Museum of Photographic Arts, the Center for Creative Photography, um, the International Center of Photography in New York, in, in part because the, they were founded at this moment when photography was coming into its own in the art world, and they were sort of an, an assertion of photography's relevance and importance in a wider visual field, um, usually having to do with art, but International Center of Photography was particularly concerned with um, what we might think of as photojournalism or documentary photography, um, but presented as art. So now that the, the, those of us that sort of grew up thinking the mission was to make photography be recognized as a full partner with painting, sculpture, whatever, um, don't have a whole lot to do because it is. If you, go, if you go to any biennial, if you go to Chelsea in New York, if you go um, to a, an art magazine like Art Forum or Art in America, photography is all over the place and it's not even called out as being photography. It's, it's like just taken for granted, I guess, in a case, uh, in a sense. And so, so you, there could be an argument that there don't, don't need to be medium-specific institutions anymore, but that would ignore the fact that photography is this special kind of um, thing, um, instrument, that exceeds art, that, that, that still functions in, in the culture, in society, in, in economic relations, and in so many different ways that exceeds sort of what most people who think about what art is consider. But that work, as I hope I've shown, um, can then be addressed to an audience for art and become part of a a broader dialogue about photography than, than we grew up having, which was, oh, photography is so beautiful, it can be art. Um, it's, it's more interesting now to think about photography functioning in the world of art as a reflection of what else it does outside the world of art. One of the, um, in 1923, Maholi Naj uh, said, a knowledge of photography is just as important as that of the alphabet. The illiterate of the future will be ignorant of the use of camera and pen alike. And that was a long time ago. He was a smart guy. He was a very smart guy, um, which in my mind really points to the importance of a, a subject-specific museum that is a photography museum. Um, I mean, if you think of the fact that there's at least six billion cellular phones worldwide, you know, over two million photographs uploaded to Facebook each day, I'm sure these numbers are increasing as, as we sit here. Um, and, you know, that Flickr hosts over five billion images, I mean, on and on and on. So what you were showing was part of that transition within uh, the art of photography, but the whole technology is changing and, and our interaction with it is changing as well. So you want me to make a question out of that? Um, you want me to argue with that? No, no. Um, but this transformative moment that we're in um, is, I think, a very important one. And as you said, everybody is a photographer. You don't have to ask the question anymore. But not everybody is literate. Yeah, it's, it's I guess what I'd add is it, it's paradoxical that as, as the act of photography becomes universal that the understanding of of how it works and, and I don't just mean in terms of you know apertures and shutter speeds but kind of how how pictures function and how 
pictures influence people, um, that all ne that in some ways is, is needs to be taught even more. That 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 visual literacy is actually more complicated and more important now in, a, in an environment where there are more cameras and more images than it probably was even in Maholi's time. And I think you can see that in that that schools from kindergarten to uh, universities have standards or core competencies, we like to call them in, in school talk, um, that have to do with understanding how visual images work. It's not, it's not that they're self-evident and, and readily understandable in, 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 the, in the way that they either impact us or the way that they function out in the world. And understanding that, I think, is, is really something. As much as photography students learn to make photographs, it's also they're learning about how photographs work. One of the interesting things that's been happening as we have internal uh, conversations about exactly what the Becky Moore Center for Visual Learning um, will be, can be, should be, is the fact that we are a collection-based institution. We have an extensive library. We have a print collection that covers the, the history of photography. And in my mind, that makes um, that becomes even more important as, as part of the context for understanding what a lot of these changes are and, and to be able to, to teach an understanding of uh, visual learning as evidenced by the exhibitions that we have of the 19th century and um, a range of work from the 20th century to the youth exhibition that we have up. I mean, there's right there you have uh, an amazing spread from almost the beginning of photography to yesterday. I mean, I think if you want to teach or encourage people to analyze pictures in all the different ways they can be analyzed, that that having a picture up on a wall with space around it that you have to stare at for even if it's only 10 seconds, but um, that's probably longer than you stare at your Instagram feed or whatever else you have going on on your phone. I mean, it, it's like the, 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 abil the ability to rifle through visual experience isn't actually making you, isn't helping you understand what it is you're looking at. It just becomes this kind of strange distraction. It's like babble um, in terms of language. So I think that that the virtue of good old-fashioned print photography and having pictures that are hung on walls is that is that it really changes the attention span and and changes the way in which we interact with pictures. It interacts with the authentic. You know, even if it's a, a photograph, it's still an authentic photograph. It is 19th century albumin print, or it's a salt paper print, or, you know, it, it um, adds to the information that is provided. And the process is very much a part, at least in the 19th century, of what that final object is yeah. and, and how we relate to it. I mean, the more, the more difficult problem is in terms of keeping the, cur the collection current because it, in a sense the all this new media presentation and people putting things up on sites in in the internet is going to eventually create the same kind of problem that um, early video is now experiencing which is all the recording mechanisms for the for video the kinds of tape that were used the kind of machines that were used are all obsolete and have been retired so you either have to keep reprocessing it to keep it current or um, buy an endless supply of machines. It's like when I heard that Kodak was discontinuing slide projectors, I had my department buy five of them so we would like have them in reserve, but now I'm wondering why I did that. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so, so if, if somebody's work exists as a interactive website, how does a museum collect that in a way that's going to keep it around and be retrievable and accessible and all that kind of stuff. So, so 
all this excitement about new media comes with its share of difficulties for a museum environment. Um, an interesting phenomenon, or it appears as an interesting phenomena. We uh, had an exhibition recently, part of uh, an exhibition we do every three years, where we, um, it's an invitational and it's contemporary California photographers, and Staking Claim was uh, the most recent one. And I was uh, very intrigued with the fact that so many of the artists were um, really going back to the very basic fundamentals of photography. I mean, here you just showed us a number of artists that are using surveillance and technology and uh, grabbing images from you know, the internet and or participatory in a way where um, um, you know, that she was having a relation, you know, creating a relationship with people that were doing the surveillance so that she could have access to the material. But in this exhibition, we had photographers um, that were building their own cameras, that were making um, images that were one of a kind, that were processing them in, you know, uh, the lake water of the scene where they were photographed. I mean, it, it are you seeing a lot of that from your perspective? Are, are students and, and um, artists that you're seeing engaging with that for a, a reason? I mean, is it a response to all this new technology? Is it trying to make it unique? Is it a combination of those reasons? Yeah, I think there's like a yearning for that singularity or aura or authenticity of of the thing, so there, there are, there have been since the end of the 20th century artists really fascinated with photograms, with just drawing with chem photochemicals on sensitive paper, with, with the kind of um, cliche. There are really early, early processes that that Talbot tried out. I mean, um, and it's hard to tell. I mean, part of part of that seems to be. Nostalgia, if you're old enough to have remembered it in the first place. Um, part of it is is kind of retro cool, like you know, black converses or something. Um, and and um, but it's but it's been consistent because I remember in when I first got engaged with photography that that when there started to be colleges and universities hiring people to teach, they all. They always said in their description of the job, you know, must know how to do alternative processes. So, so this whole idea that there's been an alternative, what's what's interesting now is nobody calls it alternative processes because it's just a bunch of processes and take your pick. So, the the alternative processes idea was that there was a hegemony of black and white photography, believe it or not, at the time, or photography as delivered by Kodak, and and now it's a lot clearer and that's salutary effect that that there's just all kinds of ways to make images that come from cameras or images that use light sensitive material but i but you know i think that i i am initially skeptical of um tin types and daguerreotypes that are that are made by contemporary people and because they, it seems to me it needs to have some kind of relationship both to the past and to the present, not just be kind of look like a Civil War photograph or something. So, again, in the conversations that uh, you've been having over the last two days, um, can you talk a little bit more about your thoughts on what a, a Center for Visual Learning should be? Or do you need to process that a little bit more before I put you out there in public? Um, well, don't hold me to it. But I guess what I, I, the way I've been approaching the idea of a Center for Visual Learning is it's a great opportunity to create some new way of thinking about how to program, not, on, not only in a museum context, but in a kind of community context of how you're going to engage people in this particular time when um, this um, 
you know, plethora of cameras and of ways to take pictures and of um, digital transmission is around and, and how to devise strategies. So I, I see it really as a test bed for thinking about new kinds of photographic education that's not divorced from an, the academy but, but is outside of any kind of academic um, requirements because God knows um, colleges and universities are now having to follow much more rigid um, set of rules than they used to that, that because you're a museum, because you're operating through the goodwill of the people in the community, that, that you can actually try a lot of things and be project-based um, and be engaged in a kind of feedback loop that allows you to refine and discover how, how things get done most effectively and that then the challenge will be to communicate those to the you know, national and international audiences, which I think is an important part of whatever you're doing is to let everybody know what you're doing. Um, I picked up something from the Monday uh, New York Times and I was actually gonna bring the, uh, I made a copy of it, uh, I was gonna bring the New York Times so you could see that it was authentic, but um, they were talking about, um, it was about news, but in my mind what was important is they talked about Facebook having a fifth of the world, um, about 1.3 billion people logging on at least monthly. Um, that combined with the number of visual images that are uploaded and, I mean, technology, we're in a time of transition with this new technology. Some of it's not quite so new, but the number of people engaging with it and using it um, is, is pretty um, astounding, I think. And it, it looks like it's growing and will continue to grow, though who's actually accessing it um, changes in terms of their age. But you know, it, it, the article also goes on to say that 30% of adults in the United States get their news on Facebook. So, this is making the New York Times very unhappy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering, it, well, not wondering. I, in my mind, that really validates uh, the importance of the museum's role in, in all of this conversation, um, not only to exhibit historical and contemporary work, but to be able to uh, experiment with technologies that engage audiences of different demographics, but also to kind of share this information. I mean, when you're in a transition, uh, a, a real transitional time, you know, it's, it's not always clear, or it's a little less clear at this point, uh, I think, with what the outcome is gonna be. A few years ago, a few years ago, it's probably 15 years ago now, 20 years ago, when, um, so I remember conversations with a lot of photographers who were horrified at the thought of digital photography. First of all, it was really expensive. And second of all, it was overwhelming. And, you know, they thought it was the end of everything. And, um, and yet now it's, it's sort of not that, that crucial a dialogue anymore, but how people are engaging with the images and um, how they're participating. That's really the big change, I think, and, and the area that I find most interesting to follow. Comments? Well, I think there's an, another way you can look at it, which is that photography just goes on in, in some ways the way it has. It's just that the, there's been a new way of making pictures because, I mean, selfies is a great sort of buzzword and, and it's a popular thing to do, but we used to call them self-portraits and it was a genre that's existed forever. So, so digital photography has not invented any new genre. There's like landscapes, there's portraits, there's still lifes, there's, there's still kind of ways of making pictures that digital photography didn't have anything to do with. It just piggybacked onto them. So, the, so that's why I stressed the, the transmission and reception aspect of how pictures get around in the culture is 
in some ways what what's new to photography about the digital technology the and I think I learned this when I was at the Friends of Photography in San Francisco was that that um because I met the guy that started Photoshop is that he was a big fan of Ansel Adams so he basically when he devised the algorithms or whatever they are for um, digital photography that are in Photoshop, he was using um, Ansel Adams' books about the techniques of photography and, and what the sensitometry is of photography as his guide. So basically, Photoshop's designed to be um, a replication of the kind of chemical film-based photography we already knew. So in that sense, the actual, and the cameras. Apparently there were manufacturers who wanted to make cameras that looked nothing like cameras that we were already used to, but they didn't get a very big reception. I mean, it's like, oh, that camera looks like a stapler. How exciting. Um, that, that they ended up ha having to make digital cameras look exactly like film cameras. And, the, and apparently there's no reason that they should. They just kind of do. I mean, f that's why phones are really exciting, because phones, well, actually, I'm old enough that I don't think phones look like, I mean, digital phones don't look like telephones, I remember, but um, they don't look like cameras either. No, they are starting to change that. There's um, a ball phone, there's, you know, but they do look weird, and you kind of wonder how popular they're going to be. There are be. attachments for your mobile yeah. phones that make it look like a camera. That's exciting. Um, what I'd like to do is open up the conversation to uh, any questions or comments that the audience might have. Um, your opportunity. There's a man with a microphone right up here. There, a man with his hand raised. Joaquin, right there. I have a couple of questions. Um, it seems, and I've been in photography for 54 years. My first camera was a 620 Diana Mark IV box camera. My current camera bag is 100% digital. And the only thing that um, I've noticed is that we seem to be in a period of our lives as photographers and museum goers where we're losing the focus, pardon the expression, on the image for the value of the story. And you take that woman in the red, the red coat. The image in and of itself isn't spectacular in any way without the story, of, the backstory of coercing the police into helping her uh, create the picture. But ultimately, what goes up on the wall here, and pretty much everywhere, where, where art, where photography is art, as opposed to reportage, um, the image has to stand on its own. Um, it seems like we go from, a f again, pardon the word focus, from the story behind the image to the image, and we just go back and forth between film and digital, or between digital and telephone, or, or, or DSLR and a telephone, or some um, mechanical part of the process instead of focusing on the image that we create. I, am I wrong in, in my perception that this is what's happening? Uh, and it seems to be happening on a yearly basis now where it used to happen on a decade basis. I remember in the, in the 60s when I started to move from photojournalism into art, um, my group felt that if it wasn't palladium print, it wasn't art. And I remember in the, in the late 70s when I was working for a photographic company, um, if it wasn't a Cibachrome print, it wasn't a color print. And um, it seems to me that what you're talking about now is very similar to that, and it's not changing very much. Am I wrong? No, I think you make a point that's shared by a lot of people that, that are... Um 
bemused or angry about the that um, that the terms of how a photograph is received as art have less to, less to do with the qualities of the picture than with the notion of why the picture is actually existing there in front of you, or that, or that you know some that we've forsaken some ideal of beauty that used to propel what we thought of photography as an art, and and it's like you stated it very well. That's that's a condition, and it's you might think of it as a big s cycle that we go through periods of that, but um, you're not making it up. <laughs> and the challenge within the museum context is um, this is all part of the dialogue. That you know there are artists who are working with new approaches. There, the exhibition after Ansel Adams that we uh, that just closed was a good example. You know, it had Ansel Adams, but it also had a younger generation that was approaching the same subject matter in very different ways. So each generation, you know, I, I think it's actually a good thing that uh, generations ex explore new ideas whenever possible. I mean, it's, it's part of the artistic process to, to keep exploring. The fact that we may, um, assume within our own experience that this is the ideal, that is going to change over time. I mean, taste in music change, taste in food, taste in, you know, how we, uh, the kind of house we live in. I mean, it, it, it's, um, and, and our role in a museum is to offer various experiences, opportunities to view the variety that's there whenever possible. Um, you can't do it all the time because you have to change shows and you have wide audiences who have different interests, but you know, you're know you touching on something that is uh, a very powerful situation for a lot of people. A very, you know, they have emotional responses to it. Uh, my comment comes from uh, digital art rather than photography. Uh, I started with as, as a cut and paste collage artist back in the, and in the 1990s. I wanted to get rid of the cut lines, so they used Photoshop just to get rid of those cut lines. And then I realized it could do so much more. Uh, and then uh, I began to take better photographs, but it was always photo source manipulation, so that I veered into a painting. And so it's not just the photograph standing alone as that community, but there is a community of artists that are using those same tools in very different ways. Uh, so I, I, just building on your, com your conversation here is that, uh, yes, there is photography, but then there's all these other ways in which artists use that uh, particular tool set. I'm not sure that was a question, but... But it, but I mean, this isn't exactly what you're talking about. But the, but just so everyone knows that the, it's kind of now de rigueur that that artists' retrospectives, who we know as being painters or printmakers or something, that they that it turns out that they've also got photographs that museums feel are worth showing. So, you know, Clifford Still, who is an abstract painter suddenly has a show which has all his abstract paintings and then oh yes and he took all these photographs so so there so there has been and probably always will be this this crossover where it's not so easy to just isolate um, photography out of, of somebody's career or artists just aren't as interested in just being um, associated with just one medium the way they probably were 50 years ago and they're just currently opening the Picasso photography exhibition in, in New York. Yeah. Um, other questions? In the back? Uh, this is a comment more than a question. And it is in regards to what you, Deborah, mentioned about the purpose of a photography museum or a specific media. The way I see it is that not because we all carry cameras, we're photographers, we're just, there's more cameras out there, but you need to have a standard or a, a curator, 
I mean, that's what you do. You curate out of everything that's out there what is what you consider to be the most relevant in the different platforms, be it journalistic or artistic. Uh, so that now that there are more people out there taking pictures, there's more reason for you to exist. You need to tell that audience what photography is really for and how to use it. So I don't see the museum specific in media disappearing. I see it as being more important now, since there's more of us out there with cameras. I have to say that I agree with you. I think that uh, the role of a photography museum today is even more important, that, the, um, that photography is the visual currency of our time. And while everyone has a camera and takes pictures, I don't necessarily think that makes everyone photographers. And so, you know, our role is to help in that uh, literacy, to help people understand. And it can be helping them be more creative. It can help them with uh, empowerment. It can help them with understanding um, the context that they see images. To be better visual consumers is important as well. And um, so, thank you. I agree with you on that. Good to know. Good to know. OK. David? And we'll get. Might you have some specific suggestions as to what person or persons might best be hired to um, organize the Center for Visual Learning? And secondly, what would you put in the center? Uh, books, computers? desks. Okay, well, except that's why you're here. Um, we're in the process of defining, uh, creating a job description for what the director of the Center for Visual Learning will be. Um, I would say that it's not about what you put in a Center for Visual Learning because it's not necessarily a, just a single physical space, but more of a concept. So in a way, we have a lot of the component parts already. I, as I mentioned a little bit earlier at the beginning, um, I think collection is really valuable for that. I think the, the library is really valuable for that because those are really sources of uh, information, of, ex of um, the authentic, of learning, of information. And um, certainly, technology needs to be a part of that. I think what's more important is to ask, how are you reaching and how are you defining the audience for a center for visual learning? And it's not necessarily people that just walk in the door of the institution, but there's audiences that you can reach in a virtual way. But ultimately, how do you bring them back in to experience you know, the rich resources of a museum, which are its collections? So. Uh, we talk about doing things like uh, multi-touch interactive technology, but we've already been uh, integrating technology into the, the museum visitor's experience, from QR codes to iPads to um, videos, which are, in a funny way, a more traditional technology. But we've actually been um, providing videos that our choices so that you can choose smaller five-minute segments rather than sitting there and, and having to watch one 20-minute, 30-minute video. So, um, so it's part of the ongoing journey that we're taking right now in trying to answer all of those questions and, and really try and figure that out. So um, I should invite you to all the meetings, David, because uh, it's definitely an the conversation that we're having. I, I hope that helped answer a little bit. Okay, um, I know you had a question here, and then we'll go there and there. So we've spoken a lot today about differences in like epochs and eras of what photography is and where it's going, uh, whether that be in people of today using technologies of the past or telling uh, where, where the image is suffering, quote unquote, for sake of subject matter or subject itself. I wonder if your opinion is, is not that because everybody in this room has a camera in their pocket and because editing software and things like Instagram have made it so much easier for 
uh, the everyday person walking around to close the gap, so to speak, on the professional photographer, that that is where that swing is coming from, essentially trying to delineate themselves from the masses. In other words, you know, when this gentleman started taking photographs 40 years ago, 50 years ago, what a person who owned a point-and-shoot could do with that point-and-shoot versus what he, as a skilled professional, could do was a big gulf. Today, that gap has closed dramatically to where I can take my cell phone and take a picture that's very, very close to what a professional photographer could take. And are those, those, those techniques of going back to relics of the past or substituting substance and story uh, in respect of technique more kind of why we're seeing those trends? Thoughts? No, I think you're. I think you are right. Yes, I think you're right. <laughs> that that the you know the gap between whatever a professional photographer is and um, somebody with a cell phone camera is has n has narrowed from um, the the age when like people didn't know how to do anything with photography because it seemed so complicated. Um, so absence, some sort of you know, licensing authority where you can go up to a window and, and get a card that says you're a professional photographer, um, that 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 makes it that makes it a, to me a more interesting environment actually that that the the question of what you know, whatever anybody's idea of good photography is or anybody's idea of like what kind of photography they want to look at is, um, means that you have to think about what your visual experience is even harder. And I guess to connect your question with the comment that we had before about the, the um, function of the museum being to um, curate visual experience and kind of show us what the good photographs are, um, you know that that notion of the museum as authority is less interesting to me than the notion of the museum as a place where interpretation takes place and questions get asked so that that maybe the pictures that are be presented in the museum aren't anybody's ideas of the most beautiful pictures that are around but have some other reason for um being looked at, so I think that's that's always a um, that's always a question. Is kind of like is the museum showing us this work because it decides it's the best, or is there some life lesson that we're supposed to get out of this um, experience of looking at these pictures that that is extra aesthetic? I guess you would say. Um, Joaquin, I think we had two back there, and then this gentleman. Um, there was one over, yeah, and a woman. I'll ask in the it back. once. So, as a student trying to learn and increase the uh, capabilities of my art, in your opinion, from where you got, from where you guys sit, um, what are good sources to review and to see where art is going nowadays with the digital photography? versus digital art and manipulations and things along those lines go. Well, it's not just digital, but so. Um, wow. Well, I always think it's good to go out and look at work, look at what artists are doing, and um, go to galleries, go to look at books. Books are actually a really, in this modern age, of being able to transmit images, look up everything online. Uh, the photo book, the art book is just, I, I think the printing is phenomenal now. And there's a lot of information in one place. But you have to educate yourself and, and ultimately make some decisions for yourself of what you think is interesting and challenging. But I also think you need to understand the past of your medium. You need to understand its history so that you can understand what's being created now. That's my quick. Okay. ABC. Subscribe to Aperture. Subscribe to Blind Spot. B gets two. Go to Brooklyn. And go to Chelsea. Um, Learn a lot. 
So I'm losing track, so I'll let you. There was that gentleman over there. Hi. I come about my question from a different perspective because I'm a teacher educator in for elementary school teachers, and I'm concerned about visual literacy. Now, Deborah, with your um, comment about photography being the um, our means, our cultural capital, pretty much, I'm paraphrasing. And Andy, you said that um, that transmission of images is really important. So I'm wondering if your goals in the center would be limited to art, because I think about photography as visual texts and our need to teach children to analyze visual texts that move beyond what we may or may not call art. But the assumption is because it's in a museum that that's what will be, that, that will be the medium or that would be the mediational tool that you'll be using. Well, we should actually let Joaquin answer that one. Um, but um, first of all, you shouldn't assume, we're talking about photography and photography has um, many facets to it. So I wouldn't assume that what you see in a museum of photography is only within an art context. Um, a lot of it is, but also how we define the art of photography, I think, can be very broad. But it really is, um, I think what's more important that we try to do w with young children especially is help them slow down and through a single image l gain the tools to look at, understand, and talk about, to analyze the visual image. Because what's really the issue in my mind is that there's so many images that are coming at them, that they're producing, that's, you know, that they have access to, that they don't have the ability to, you know, to really question those images. And so whether it's in an art category or you know, some other category to me is not what's important, but it's how you uh, give them the tools to read that image. And, and again, if you can slow them down to a single image, then they can translate that to all of the images that they see. And, and visual literacy is not my field, but from what I uh, um, understand of it is it's, a, it's incredibly broad and huge. I mean, any kind of visual experience is not even representational things of which photography is a small subset of what gets represented in the world. So, you know, there's part of visual literacy which has to do with recognizing that I'm holding a microphone in front of my mouth. So, so part of the task of the, of the center is to locate what part of the spectrum of visual literacy it's going to address. And I think that's, that's one of the things that's going to be a iterative process and something that the great minds here at the museum are going to be thinking about really, really hard. Um, but I think it would be a safe bet to say that whatever the Center for Visual, Visual Literacy does, that it's not all going to be on the walls of the museum space. It's going to be other places as well. I think, okay, we'll get to you. So for the uh, photography students and, and some of the things that have been discussed with the flood of images, it seems that part of the challenge uh, is getting your work noticed among the flood of uh, images. And then also the kind of typical response that uh, I had recently with a, a newspaper who got um, acquired some of my images. and. And the editor contacted me and said, you know, I really am trying to improve the photography that we get for our publication. Can you tell me what camera you had? Um, because it seems to be really sharp and really good photographs that are well composed. Nothing about the technique or the quality of the photographer having anything to do with the image as the perception. Must tell us what the newspaper was, <laughs> so we can all sell our pictures there. 
Well, getting noticed um, is really hard, but um, you know, if you make good work, and I mean, that's, I see a lot of work. And um, whether it's um, in, in other galleries, um, whether it's at portfolio reviews, whether it's um, at, at uh, APAD, the uh, Association of International Photography Art Dealers, or some, you know, um, when you've been looking as long as I have, it really does take something special that is different, well done, exciting, uh, interesting idea to really jump out. There's a lot of good work out there, you're right, and uh, making that difference. But um, as Andy mentioned early on, uh, you're not going to, you know, to the students, you're not going to make a living at it. Um, I always say the most important thing is to make the work. And, you know, you just really need to, to make that work. If you're trying to make a living, that's something different, and you're probably going to need a website and do other things to, to really support yourself. But um, yeah, it is a challenge, and, and I don't have a real concrete answer for you on that. So I don't know if you do, since you work so much with students. Well, there's, there's um, a negotiation between what you authentically have to say and understanding that really well, and then what what the discourse of the art of photography happens to be at any one moment and the, the conjunction of those two things so that if you're, what your authentic expression is happens to be something that's of interest to curators and you know people in the judgment seat of photography, then kind of you've pulled the right lever and hit the jackpot. You know, what, there, there, are, there are some artists who think if they chase what is hot or what people seem to want to know, if they intuit what the next thing is going to be, that they'll, they'll strike it rich. And then, and then there are people that have no interest in what everybody else is showing in any gallery or museum anywhere. They're just going to do what they do. And most people live in between those things. And I also think we're talking now about a generational um, uh, issue because we've been um, hosting a series of teen, um, I'm blanking on the word that I want, um, teen advisors that we're asking them what their relationship to a, a museum like ours is, teen engagement. And, you know, would they want their work to be shown on the walls of a museum? And, and they're saying, well, no. I, their ideal is to have their video uploaded to YouTube and get lots of hits. So they, they want to jump right over uh, the gallery or the, the institution. So, you know, that, that climate is changing out there and, and what people's expectations are of how they're going to deliver that, that work and how people are going to respond to it. So. So, please. Yeah, briefly. Uh, in 1996, oh yeah, in 1996, uh, Congress passed the Telecommunications Act, which removed the restrictions on uh, media consolidation. And in the two decades uh, since then, we've seen many of the, the landscape of media consolidate into the hands of only a handful of uh, media properties, media corporations. And as uh, curator, curators and moderators and educators, well, what is your opinion of the state of, um, I guess, uh, the, the role of media as uh, you know, carriers of the images we use to create a consensus opinion of what reality is? And uh, some of your slideshows seem to directly address the role of authority in creating a sense of uh, either the surveillance state or what this technology can be used to, um, you know, to do to manage uh, civilization. Yeah, I have nightmares about Google and the NSA. And I think Google started when I like found uh, a picture of the front of my building where I lived. That any. I don't know, it was, it was something to do with work where they said, oh, put yourself, put your address in this little 
slot, and the next thing I knew, everybody in the place where I worked could see the front door of my house. It was like an unpleasant situation. Um, and then the fact that the you know there's all sorts of exciting things happening in the future, like facial recognition software, where the NSA will be able to scan videotapes and identify exactly who you are just by the way you look, and um, sort of moving beyond fingerprints. Um, so, so the kind of collection of photographic images is going to become interesting in in the same way that. Um, Deb and I were talking about this earlier. When, when you know, you innocently Google, you know, a Corvette, then the next time you look at the newspapers, there's like pictures of Corvettes all over the place. So, so, so that kind of um, we might think of that as like an interactive image universe, isn't that great? But the more the more in which that's consolidated, and that is a, is a worry. I mean, that's why. I mean, now we have sort of. We have Apple and Google duking it out um, in, in, a, in sort of pl who's going to be the platform is going to have all the content. I mean, I do not want Facebook to own the news. Um, in fact, I don't want Facebook to be a, a giant organization, but, um, you know, so there's, so there's a lot of anxiety about how this can happen, and, and the regulations that we've had about um, broadcast media have worked pretty well to the extent that you know NBC cannot have more than seven own more than seven local television stations or whatever the rule is. Um, that that kind of has prevented th there from being one giant broadcaster. Um, so I I think all the the net neutrality is an issue. There there are all sorts of um, issues that politicians are not quite clear about that um, need to be presented, and there there was a period in which the um, digital giants like Google didn't do any lobbying in Washington, lobbying in Washington, and everybody thought that was so unique and um, peculiar that now they have a really big lobbying organization in Washington. So. Um, they're probably going to get what they want quicker than we get what we want. That's from that's my cynical inside the Beltway perspective. Um, but I also think we can look globally, and while um, there may be limitations, there's a power of getting information out. The problem is how accurate it can be, and it's um, but it also shows countries that try and cut off that. Uh, information because it's a, you know it is so powerful, so we're in a real again a really funny moment in in our lives and and in in terms of how information is conveyed it can be extremely controlled and yet it's extremely it's extremely free and and everything in between so be cynical about everything you see um, but also understand that it's powerful and whole governments try and, and cut off their citizens' access to information online. So it's a, it's a big question. I think we had another, did yes. you have a question? Who yeah, had a yeah. question? Yes, and over then here. we'll and take one we'll, more after one that. One more after that, these okay. are our last two questions, so. I noticed that um, a lot of the audience has talked about art in a photographic form. I'm just wondering if it's the photographer's responsibility to try to communicate through their photos only. Do you think that the photographer should try to communicate their art through the photograph and that's it? Or is there other means to do so as the photographer's art? So, yeah, as someone who, um, teaches how to write an artist statement to photographers, I have to say that um, I'm actually ambivalent about that. I don't, th I don't think there's any should, that it has to be um, you know, prescriptive, but it seems to me there are certain kind of art and certain kind of artists who want um, 
pictures to be able to speak for themselves, and I'm sympathetic to that, but more often and, and prevalently, the majority of photographs that we encounter are in some sort of context of text, whether it's in journalism or whether it's in wall labels in museums or whether it's your artist statement that you attach to your website. I mean, the, the I guess the idea that, that photographs are free of any context and that words are, are like an intrusion on their autonomy, I don't believe in because I think that, um, that you know, just by being in a certain order or being edited in a certain way that they're, they're already contextualized. And sometimes language can add to that contextualization and if it's um, done really badly, like some of my students, it can actually subtract from that contextualization. Okay, do we have one more or? And I suggest it's a, it's, a, it's a question, not a comment, please. One last one over here, okay. So, uh, some of the, I'm an edu uh, advocate of photography as well as a photographer. And some comments um, that, or some words that came up that I was curious about. And uh, the phrase, uh, better visual consumers, um, and then uh, standard and core competency. And so, there's a lot of talk about technology, there's a lot of talk about delivery systems, um, there's a lot of talk about um, the eyes and the mind. What I'm curious about is, particularly as we have students in the, in, in the house, is where's, where, what role and function does the spirit, the internal being of curiosity, how does that fit within the context of visual learning, visual literacy? I always thought we could start a religion based on photography, and, and that might be the place to, to include that. You're referring to the creative process, really, more than anything. And we've been talking, in a lot of instances, in a much broader way. Um, so I don't want to negate the importance of the creative process, but as we've been talking about, people photograph for many different reasons. They photograph because they want instant gratification. They want the selfie. They want to, you know, they're doing it for a whole lot of reasons other than, uh, you know, the, the creative um, process. And so that's what we're trying to do is, is uh, we're, we're talking, so we've been talking in general terms about that, but the creative process is a really important one. But some of that creative process can be very intellectual and, and shouldn't be dismissed. I mean, not everyone feels that it, you know, it, it spiritually lifts them up, but it, it's important for them to, to send a message. I mean, every artist is different. And, um, but it, you know, I don't say we're, we're ignoring it. It's just, just an, an, another part of the, the larger conversation. Okay, um, so I want to thank you all for being here, and um, I want to thank Andy um, for the conversation, and great comments and great questions. Thank you so much.